see yourself doing it. Without vision the people perished did not refer to a good eyesight. It was the eyes of the mind that counted in days of old, just as they do today. But given vision, imagination, the ability to visualize conditions and things a month or a year ahead, given the eyes of the mind, there is no limit to your value or to your capabilities. The wealthy men, the big men, the successful men, vision their success in their mind's eye before ever they won them from the world. From the beginning of time, nothing has ever taken on material shape without first being visualized in mind. The only difference between the sculptor and the mason is in his mental image behind his work. Rodin employed masons to hew his blocks of marble into the general shape of the figure he was about to form. That was mere mechanical labor. Then Rodin took it in hand, and from the rough-hewn piece of stone there sprang the wondrous figure of the thinker. That was art. The difference was all in the imagination behind the hands that wield mallet and chisel. After Rodin had formed his masterpiece, ordinary workmen copied it by the thousand. Rodin's work brought fabulous sums. The copies brought day wages. Conceiving ideas, creating something is what pays. In sculpture, all is an else. Mere handwork is worth only hand wages. The source and center of all man's creative power, the power that above all things lifts him above the level of brute creation, and that gives him dominion, is his power of making images of the power of the imagination. Fancy would convert that which is real into pretense and sham. Imagination enables one to see through the appearance of a thing to what it really is. There is a very real law of cause and effect which makes the dream of the dreamer come true. It is the law of visualization, the law that calls into being in its outer material world everything that is real in the inner world. Imagination pictures the thing you desire. Vision idealizes it. It reaches beyond the thing that is into the conception of what can be. Imagination gives you the picture. Vision gives you the impulse to make the picture you own. Make your mental image clear enough. Picture it vividly in every detail, and the genie of your mind will speedily bring it into being as an everyday reality. The law holds true of everything in life. There is nothing you can rightfully desire that cannot be brought into being through visualization. Get that picture impressed upon your subconscious mind. See it. Believe it. The genie of your mind will find the way to make it come true. The keynote of successful visualization is this. See things as you would have them be instead of as they are. Close your eyes and make clear mental pictures. Make them look and act as they would be in real life. In short, daydream, but daydream with a purpose. Concentrate on the one idea to the exclusion of all others, and continue to concentrate on that one idea until it has been accomplished. Do you want an automobile, a home, a factory? They can all be one in the same way. They are in their essence all of them ideas of mind, and you will but build them up in your own mind first, stone by stone, complete in every detail you will find that the genie of your mind can build them up similarly in a material world. The building of a transcontinental railroad from a mental picture gives the average individual an idea that it is a big job. The fact of the matter is, the achievement, as well as the perfect mental picture, is made up of millions of little jobs, each fitting in its proper place, and helping to make up the whole. A skyscraper is built from individual bricks, the laying of one brick being a single job which must be completed before the next brick can be laid. It is the same with any work, any study. As we become permanent drunkards by so many separate drinks, so we become saints in the moral and authorities and experts in the practical and scientific spheres by so many separate acts and hours of working. Remember that the only limit to your capabilities is the one you place upon them. There is no law of limitation. The only law is supply. Through your subconscious mind you can draw upon universal supply for anything you wish. The ideas of universal mind are as countless as the sand of the seashore. Use them and use them lavishly, just as they were given. There is a little poem by Jesse B. Rittenhouse that so well describes the limitations that most of us put upon ourselves that I quote it here. I bargained with life for a penny, and life would pay no more. However, I begged at evening when I counted my scanty store. For life is a just employer, he gives you what you ask, but once you have set the wages, why, you must bear the task. I worked for a menial's hire, only to learn dismayed, that any wage I had asked of life 
life would have surely paid. Aim high. If you miss the moon, you may hit a star. Everyone admits that this world and all the fast firmament must have been thought into shape from the formless void by some universal mind. That same universal mind rules today, and it has given to each form of life power to attract to itself whatever it needs for its perfect growth. The tree, the plant, the animal, each one finds its need. You are an intelligent, reasoning creature. Your mind is a part of universal mind, and you have power to say when you require for perfect growth. Don't sell yourself for a penny. Whatever price you set upon yourself, life will give you. So aim high. Demand much. Make a clear, distinct mental image of what it is you want. Hold it in your thought. Visualize it. See it. Believe it. The ways and means of satisfying that desire will follow, for supply always comes on the heel of demand. It is by doing this that you take your fate out of the hands of chance. It is in this way that you control the experience you are to have in life. But be sure to visualize only what you want. The law works both ways. If you visualize your worries and your fears, you will make them real. Control your thought and you will control circumstances. Conditions will be what you make them. Most of us are like factories where two-thirds of the machines are idle, where the workmen move around in listless, dispirited sort of way, doing only the tenth part of what they could do if the head of the plant were watching and directing them. Instead of that, he is off idly dreaming or waiting for something to turn up. What he needs is someone to point out to him, his listless workmen and idle machines, and show him how to put each one to working full and overtime. And that is what you need, too. You are working at only a tenth of your capacity. You are doing only a tenth of what you are capable of doing. The time you spend idly wishing or worrying can be used in so directing your subconscious mind that it will bring you anything of good you may desire. Keep the one thought in mind. See it being carried out step by step. And you can knit any group of workers into one homogeneous whole, all centered on the one idea. You can accomplish any one thing. You can put across any definite idea. The error of the ages is the tendency mankind has always shown to limit the power of mind, or its willingness to help in time of need. We may know that we are temples of the living God. We may even be proud of the fact but we never take advantage of it to dwell in that temple, to proclaim our dominion over things and conditions. We never avail ourselves of the power that is ours. The great prophets of old had the forward look. Theirs was the era of hope and expectation. They looked for a time when the revelation should come that was to make men sons of God. Ask and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. The world has turned in vain to matter and materialistic philosophy for deliverance from its woes. In the future, the only marks of actual progress will be in the mental realm. And this progress will not be in the way of human speculation and theorizing, but in the actual demonstration of the universal, infinite mind. The world stands today within the vestibule of the vast realm of divine intelligence, wherein is found the transcendent, practical power of mind over all things. The subconscious mind is a distinct entity. It occupies the whole human body, and when not opposed in any way, it has absolute control over all the functions, conditions, and sensations of the body. While the objective or conscious mind has control over all of our voluntary functions and motions, the subconscious mind controls all of the silent, involuntary, and vegetative functions. Nutrition, waste, all secretions and excretions, the actions of the heart and the circulation of the blood, the lungs in respiration or breathing, and all cell life, cell changes and development, are positively under the complete control of the subconscious mind. This was the only mind animals had before the evolution of the brain, and it could not, nor can it yet, reason inductively, but its power of deductive reasoning is perfect, and more it can see without the use of physical eyes. It perceives by intuition. It has the power to communicate with others without the aid of ordinary physical means. It can read the thoughts of others. It receives intelligence and transmits it to people at a distance. Distance offers no resistance against the successful missions of subconscious mind. It never dies. We call this the soul mind. It is the living soul. It is this mind that carries on the work of assimilation and upbuilding while we sleep. It reveals to us things that the conscious mind has no conception of until the consummations have occurred. It can communicate with other minds without the ordinary physical means. It gets glimpses of things that ordinary sight does not behold. 
It makes God's presence an actual, realizable fact, and keeps a personality in peace and quietness. It warns of approaching danger. It approves or disapproves of a course of conduct and conversation. It carries out all the best which are given to it, providing the conscious mind does not intercept and change the course of its manifestation. It is, in short, the most powerful force in life, and when properly directed, the most beneficent. But like the live electric wire, its destructive force is equally great. It can be either your servant or your master. It can bring you evil or good. The subconscious part in us is called the subjective mind, because it does not decide and command. It is a subject rather than a ruler. Its nature is to do what is told, or what really in your heart of hearts you desire. Man lives and moves and has his being in this great subconscious mind. It supplies the intuition. Even in ordinary everyday affairs, you often draw upon its wonderful wisdom. The time will come, as H. G. Wells visioned in his Men Like Gods, schools and teachers will no longer be necessary except to show us how to get in touch with the infinite knowledge our subconscious mind possesses from infancy. The smartest man in the world is the man inside. By the man inside, I mean the other man within each one of us that does most of the things we give ourselves credit for doing. You may refer to him as nature or the subconscious self, or think of him merely as a force or a natural law. Or if you are religiously inclined, you may use the term God. I say he is the smartest man in the world. I know he is infinitely more clever and resourceful than I am, or than any other man I have ever heard of. No living man knows enough to make toenails grow. But the man inside thinks nothing of growing nails and teeth and thousands of hairs all over my body, long hairs on my head and little fuzzy ones over the rest of the surface of the skin. When I practice on the piano, I am simply getting the business of the piano playing over from my conscious mind to my subconscious. In other words, I am handing the business over to the man inside. Most of our happiness, as well as our struggles and misery, comes from this man inside. If we train him in the ways of contentment, adjustment, and decision, we will go ahead of us like a well-trained servant and do for us easily most of the difficult tasks we have to perform. The subconscious mind contains not only all the knowledge that is gathered during the life of the individual, but that in addition it contains all the wisdom of past ages. That by drawing upon its wisdom and power, the individual may possess any good thing of life, from health and happiness to riches and success. You see, the subconscious mind is the connecting link between the Creator and ourselves, between universal mind and our conscious mind. It is the means by which we can appropriate to ourselves all the good things, all the riches and abundance which universal mind has created in such profusion. Berthelot, the great French founder of modern synthetic chemistry, once stated in a letter to a close friend that the final experiments which led to his most wonderful discoveries had never been the result of carefully followed and reasoned trains of thought, but that on the contrary they came of themselves, so to speak, from the clear sky. Many persons are able to obtain knowledge which does not come to them through their senses in the usual way, but arrives in the mind by direct communication from another conscious intelligence, which apparently knows more of what concerns their welfare than their ordinary reason does. I have known a number of persons who, like myself, could tell the contents of letters in their mail before opening them. The geniuses of literature, of art, commerce, politics, and invention are, according to the scientist, but ordinary men like you and me who have learned somehow, some way, to draw upon their subconscious mind. Sir Isaac Newton is reported to have acquired his marvelous knowledge of mathematics and physics with no conscious effort. Mozart said of his beautiful sympathies that they just came to him. This is a power which transcends reason and is independent of induction. Instances of its development might be multiplied indefinitely. Enough is known to warrant the conclusion that when the soul is released from its objective environment, it will be enabled to perceive all the laws of its being. Our subconscious minds are vast magnets with the power to draw from universal mind unlimited knowledge, unlimited power, unlimited riches. Considered from the standpoint of its activities. The subconsciousness is that department of mind, which on the one hand directs the vital operations of the body, and on the other conserves, subject to the call of interest and attention, all ideas and complexes not at the moment active in consciousness. Observe then the possibility that lies before you. On the one hand, if you can control your mind in its subconscious activities, you can regulate your bodily functions. 
and can thus assure yourself of bodily efficiency and free yourself of functional disease. On the other hand, if you can determine just what idea shall be brought forth from subconsciousness into consciousness, you can thus select the materials out of which will be woven your conscious judgment, your decisions, and your emotional attitudes. To achieve control of your mind is, then, to attain health, success, and happiness. Few understand or appreciate, however, that the vast storehouse of knowledge and power of the subconscious mind can be drawn upon at will. Now and then, through intense concentration or very active desire, we do accidentally penetrate to the realm of the subconscious and register our thought upon it. Such thoughts are almost invariably realized. The trouble is that often as not, it is our negative thoughts, our fears that penetrate. And these are realized just as surely as the positive ones. What you must manage to do is to learn to communicate only such thoughts as you wish to see realized to your subconscious mind for it is exceedingly amenable to suggestion. You have heard of the man who was always bragging of his fine health, and upon whom some of his friends decided to play a trick. The first one he met one morning commented how badly he looked, and asked if he weren't feeling well. Then all the others, as they saw him, made similar remarks. By noontime the man had become to believe them, and before the end of the day he was really ill. That was a rather glaring example, but similar things are going on every day with all of us. We eat something that someone tells us isn't good for us, and in a little while we think we feel a pain. Before we know it, we have indigestion, when the chances are that if we knew nothing about the supposed indigestible properties of the food, we could eat it the rest of our days and never feel any ill effects. Let some new disease be discovered and the symptoms described in a daily paper. Hundreds will come down with it at once. Patent medicine advertisers realize this power of suggestion and cash in upon it. Read one of their ads, if you don't think you have everything that matter with you, that their nostrums are supposed to cure, you are the exception and not the rule. You suggest to your subconscious mind that whatever ills it thinks, you are getting better. And it is good psychology at that. Properly carried out, it will work wonders. Suffice it now to say that your subconscious mind is exceedingly wise and powerful, that it knows many things that are not in books that when properly used it has infallible judgment, unfailing power, that it never sleeps, never tires. Your conscious mind may slumber, it may be rendered impotent by anesthetic or sudden blow, but your subconscious mind works on. Under ordinary conditions it tends faithfully to the duties and leaves your conscious mind to direct the outer life of the body. But let the conscious mind meet some situation with which is unable to cope, and it will only call upon the subconscious. That powerful genie will respond immediately to its need. You have heard of people who have been through great dangers tell how, when death stared them in the face, and there seemed nothing they could do, things went black before them, and when they came to, the danger was past. In the moment of need, their subconscious mind pushed the conscious out of the way. The while it met and overcame the danger, impelled by the subconscious mind, their bodies could do things absolutely impossible to the ordinary conscious selves. For the power of the subconscious mind is unlimited. Whatever it is necessary for you to do in any right cause, it can give you the strength and ability to do it. Whatever of good you may desire, it can bring to you. The kingdom of heaven is within you.